Um, I'm Laverne Svernavasan. I am the Vice President of the National Program and Program Director for Education at Carnegie Corporation. And I am just thrilled to be here. Um, Carnegie, over the last uh, several years and, and very recently, has begun evolving our program strategy with increasing emphasis on engaging families and communities, parents and students, the people that we really want to make sure that we make the change for because they are our, not only our today but our future. And we realize that having a number of education reforms being executed by well-intentioned, well-meaning people without regard to true engagement, true listening uh, with the people that we are trying to help, which is all American children, then we are missing, we're missing the ball. Uh, we're missing the opportunity to make a real difference and achieve the impact that we want to achieve. So at Carnegie, we're, we've been focusing on that. Um, we see it also as a key way to create an expanded version and vision of student success and to build demand for equitable, high quality education systems so that everyone feels like it's their system for them to their end. What's been really exciting, and I want to thank Anna and her team for this over the past several days here at GFE, they've created a tent for all of us to learn and to share and, and, to, and to get some insight into what's possible when we all learn together and potentially take complementary and coherent action together in our otherwise highly fragmented system. We've seen so many promising presentations and insights into programs and opportunities being created for young people all over this country. But with that comes the challenge of how do you knit all that together to make a difference that, that works for, for everybody in our system. Um, some of the key themes that have really resonated with us are that there is a path to equity. That path to equity is through community, families, and parents, and engaging them and students. That's the way that we can make a difference. The change, change happens and moves at the speed of trust. I think that's a really important theme that's come out. And our commitment to creating the opportunity to build that trust, because that doesn't happen overnight, is so critical. And most importantly, that local collaborations can add up to national impact. So we've had the opportunity, as I said, to learn from each other here. But what we really need to figure out in the long term is how all of this learning, all of these proof points and programs and successes and promising programs that people are, are implementing around the country, how can they knit together to add up to something more than just a number of parts? We've also heard over the course of the conference about how these themes are relevant to how we make funding decisions. We've had the opportunity to listen to community stakeholders and to learn from each other and those community stakeholders. Now is our chance to listen to those beyond the education philanthropy field. GFE members have told us they want and need to collaborate with new partners. To do this effectively, there is no going it alone. I think that's an important message that we've had over the last few days. So this means working across sectors to deepen and broaden our impact. First today, we'll hear from decision makers at the heart of the nation, right where we are, Washington, DC. Here, a small group of leaders makes decisions that affect thousands of communities around the country. In a conversation that will be hosted by Scott Palmer, Senator Chris Murphy will share how he works to respect and respond to community voices as they develop national education policy. Afterwards, Scott Pattison from National Governors Association and Lillian Lowry of the Education Trust will discuss their perspectives on national policy and the role of community voices. Following this, you'll want to stay to hear from voices we wouldn't normally have access to and don't typically listen to. We're going to emphasize in those discussions cross-sector representation and interests. Local and state decision makers, grassroots organizers, parents, and media. 
immigration, journalism, policy, state education, administration, and much more. With that, I'd like to introduce my friend Scott Palmer. Scott co-founded and is a managing partner at Education Council, along with Secretary Riley and others. Previously, he served in the, White, the Clinton White House as Deputy Assistant Secretary of Education for Civil Rights at the US Department of Education, and as an advisor on the Obama transition team. So without further ado, let me turn it over to Scott. Thank you, Scott. Thank you very much, and um, thank you to Laverne, to Hannah, to Anna, to uh, everyone really on the GFE team. Christina, thank you as well. We're really excited to be here. Senator, why don't you take the center seat? That way we give you maximum exposure. Uh, we're going to turn here and talk in a moment about federal national policy. I'll just take this opportunity to say welcome to Washington, D.C., uh, where the new normal is. There is no normal. Uh, <laughs> We are gonna to try to bring some clarity to how to think about the federal national policy environment at this moment and certainly bring in the really important issues around community voice and equity that I think are so ripe and right at this moment. Uh, if you don't mind, we'll start a little bit broader and bring us narrow down to this. As you heard, we'll introduce and hear from Senator Murphy in a moment. Uh, and then our, our fantastic sort of, I don't want to say respondents, just additional perspectives as we think about devolution and other things to the national and state perspective. Thank you so much, uh, both of you, for, for being here. Uh, I hope as you're listening to this session, you'll think to yourself about the kind of big change in educational equity and opportunity and outcomes that you're trying to move and achieve in your work and what you think it will take to achieve that in our really complex education system and how your multiple strategies, including strategies around community voice and equity, uh, rely or not on uh, informing, uh, leveraging, uh, uh, making sane uh, federal national policy uh, and how that is important to uh, funding, creating room for, protecting uh, the things you care about. And hopefully that will give us, if not, clarity at this moment, some important takeaways that can be really useful in your work. So without further ado, it is my great honor uh, to introduce uh, a great leader and friend, uh, Senator Chris Murphy. Uh, Senator Murphy is the uh, Democratic Senator from the state of Connecticut. He has uh, served now one term through the Senate and previously several terms in the House through three administrations, which by my math suggests you were elected around 16, 17 years old. I'm sure there's a story there. Uh, he is on the Health, Education, Labor, and Pensions Committee, so all things education, but other important areas as well, uh, as well as appropriations, so a really important uh, double threat. Uh, also foreign affairs, so if we get to Q&A and you want to figure out North Korea, please, please bring it on. Uh, really, really appreciate that. Um, not to embarrass him, also I will add that uh, the Washington Post recently had an article about the uh, top 15 presidential contenders, thoughts about people they think uh, could, could run uh, and Chris was number three, which is pretty good. Uh, and so if you, if, if you want to make any news today, um, I, I want to welcome that. My favorite thing was they said, and he's the only one on the list who's not overhyped. That's right. Which I, I thought was like... really good. You're, you're flying right where you're supposed to be. Very backhanded Below compliment, the radar. I, think, I thought yeah. it was a good one. Yeah. In this day and age, overhyped is a, is a good thing. Um, but your leadership on education, also health, and really trying to move something in this current dynamic. Uh, also, gun control, personally, thank you. Um, uh, this is the 90% of America right here. Yeah, yeah exactly. Uh, I know, I know. And uh, you might want to just leave at that moment, actually. <laughs> right. but, uh, but one of my favorite Chris stories, I know we don't have a lot of time, is that uh, you, some of you may have seen him leaving, uh, leading what was an unbelievably eloquent and just personal all-night uh, filibuster around gun control after one of our all-too-many... <laughs> Uh, horrifying incidents. And uh, we had my young boys watch some of it uh, and give them a sense and then write uh, uh, some thank you notes to the senator and uh, uh, tweeted them or sent them and thought that's the end of that. And then at two in the morning, uh, my eight-year-old uh, got a tweet back uh, <laughs> from the senator on the floor. So this is good advice. If you're watching C-SPAN late at night, they just lob never, something in. They may never. be... <laughs> They may be know. responsive. You never know. Of, we got a lot of time. You on never our hands. know. Yeah. Uh, so, so thank you for your patience. So, the theme of, of the conference is really a powerful one around equity and around community voice. I want to get there, but yeah. if you don't mind, I want to start broader because these are, uh, I think, strangely complex times. 
Um, I, I will say one other thing as well. We uh, had, uh, we're working with, and we had great interest from a number of, of Republican uh, members as well. Uh, the House is out of session. Uh, the Senate, among other things, has several Republican senators meeting with President Trump right now around tax and finance issues. So I don't want the uh, absence to be seen as intentional on any side, but we're really thrilled that uh, Senator Murphy is willing to uh, represent the union, the, 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 the coming together of our, of our great nation. So thank you for that, case. absolutely. Yeah. Um, so uh, we're also going to try to make it so that you can uh, share some questions and we can have some discussion from the floor. We're work oh, we've got a thumbs up on that. Okay. So I have no idea how to do this except to say in the app, there is a way that you can uh, pose and post questions. And when we get to that point, if it's not clear, I'll pause for a minute and ask someone to make it clear, and then I can try to do that in real time. How does that sound? Okay. So with no further ado, let, let me start with this. Uh, paint for us, if you will, a picture of our government at, at this moment. What, what is really happening? <laughs> I know. This, this is, this, it's supposed to be the softball. Start, you guys are start, not helping me. Let's start somewhere else. Uh, no, but. Yeah. What, what is really happening in, in our Congress? It, how, how does it function? Is this, is this as unique as it seems? And, and how and can we get something done? I mean, just, just take the last seven days on the narrow issue of health care um, as, uh, as, as a way to sort of see the prism through which we watch events today. So the president said he's going to pull the funding for these uh, cost-sharing reduction payments to the insurers as a means of getting Republicans and Democrats to talk to each other. Um, you know, not the typical way by which you try to achieve consensus, uh, holding <laughs> constituents uh, and Americans hostage uh, in order to get change, but that's what he said he was going to do. So Patty Murray and Lamar Alexander, who we'll talk more about today in the context of education, did that. They came up with an agreement that, you know, would get broad bipartisan support from Republicans and Democrats. Uh, Trump said nice things about the agreement uh, yesterday, sounded as if we were moving towards uh, the implementation of something that would stabilize the health insurance markets, and then something happened last night. Uh, he got some news that he didn't like this morning. Uh, who knows? But he ended up sending out a tweet um, that was not prefaced by any notification to Congress that he would not be signing the agreement that uh, Patty and Lamar worked out. Uh, and uh, there are Republicans, as you mentioned, at the White House today. I know many of them trying to convince him to change his mind. Um, but, but that speaks to our daily existence right now. Mm -hmm. um, we are spending a lot of time cleaning up the messes uh, created by an administration who seems to value the deconstruction of norms and institutions. Um, you just have to think very differently about what the... Um, about what the goals and objectives are of this administration. Chaos, at some level, is actually um, a, a, an, an objective, given the fact that it makes news and it fulfills some of the um, anti-establishment elements of this White House. Um, and then total lack of consistency, thinking that we are doing something that is in line with the priorities of the president to find out on social media. Um, that we are not, and that we've wasted an enormous amount of time trying to do something we thought could bring folks together. Um, so I, I think we're all learning to understand what the objectives are of this administration, which are fundamentally different than uh, any other set of objectives that a Republican or Democratic administration brought to this place. And then we are struggling with how to spend our time because we are often spinning our wheels, not understanding uh, whether the policy articulated by the president is real, not understanding whether it will hold, um, and listen, that does create opportunities for Republicans and Democrats to come together, as Patty and Lamar did, as, as I have done with some Republicans on foreign policy. Um, but then layer on top of that the decision that has been made to take the big ticket issues, health care and tax reform, and move them through a process that is largely partisan. Um, and it uh, you know, frustrates what might actually be an opportunity to use the chaos of the White House to bind closer together. Um, and much of our hope is that, you know, if we can get beyond these, these very partisan conversations about health care and tax reform, maybe there might be a silver lining in that uh, on some of the issues that you all are talking about where we have shown the ability to come together, we might be able to take advantage of that space. And I want to make sure we come back to some of those issues, but let me, let me then bring in the education context, because my sense from working uh, from the outside but closely for many years is that education was a space that compared to others was much more amenable to bipartisan work and, and um, compromise. And uh, 
we'll talk about Essen a little bit, but more generally, I'm not sure that's true anymore. So, so let me ask you, then on the education side, wh what is your theory of the federal role at this moment? And is it one that's shared, or is it uh, a, a stark contrast between essential versus dismantle? Uh, the federal role. Yeah, I mean, listen, I, you know, I, I think the federal government got into education, at least elementary and secondary education, um, a long time ago for civil rights purposes, and that should remain at our core, the idea that there are local political influences that can very easily marginalize um, big populations of, of kids in the United States, and the federal government traditionally has played a role of making sure that those local political dynamics and the prejudices that still exist today, um, unfortunately, whether you like it or not, if you do polling in this country, you'll find that one third of Americans still don't support the notion that uh, blacks and whites can intermarry, right? So there are still prejudices that are, in, that are incredibly endemic in our society. Um, and the federal government has sought to smooth out uh, those um, uh, those inclinations towards marginalization. Um, and then I think we are learning um, that if we want to survive as an economy, uh, then we have to recognize we're not the cheapest place to make the widget any longer, and we're not going to be for a long period of time. Uh, thus, we have to be the smartest and most productive workforce in a way that we frankly didn't have to be 75 years ago. For, so from an economic development strategy, this, this pathway into careers and into high value added careers is part and parcel of the way in which we survive economically. Um, so, uh, you know, I, I, and I guess the question is, is there still agreement on, on, on those two uh, premises? I think there's less than there was before, but the very fact that we could get a rewrite of No Child Left Behind done, um, probably the biggest piece of policy that we did in a truly bipartisan way through regular order in the last five years suggests that there um, may still be the room here that doesn't exist uh, on other big policy areas. You know, I'm, I'm really struck by that statement though, right? The biggest uh, bipartisan through regular order, not that it isn't a significant accomplishment and important, but a lot of it was as much about fixing what wasn't working as a, a big vision of the future. And you know, that's, that's uh, important. Let's talk about that for a minute. So uh, equity, obviously critical, and ESSA, among other things, promotes this devolution toward the field. So um, from your perspective, talk about what you think both the opportunities and risks are, and to the extent you feel like you've, you, you, you can know yet, how's that going from your perspective? Um, so w w the federal government clearly overplayed its hand, and I would argue the Obama administration uh, overplayed its hand in the implementation of no child left behind. Whether you technically, um, w w whether um, Common Core was technically um, a federal mandate, let's be honest, it was part of the conversation in every single state waiver, and people started to believe that there was a much bigger federal hand in um, the way in which their schools were being run than they remember. And, um, and so there was a legitimate organic feeling from our constituents to bring the control of education back closer to them. Um, and that's what ESSA delivered. Now in the end, we were able to put these very important guardrails around it um, that we thought we were handing to uh, the Clinton administration, um, <laughs> that we ended up handing to uh, Secretary DeVos, who has, I, I, I think, underperformed uh, in terms of her uh, ability to push uh, <laughs> states to, 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 to be true to these guardrails. Um, uh, but ESSA, to many of us, represented a sweet spot, which was um, the ability to understand that people wanted education closer to them, education decisions closer to them, with those guardrails that would make sure that these kids got protected. Um, but it does now require us to build up um, the bench to make sure that every state and every local community has advocates that can use the data that is still going to be generated in order to make sure that these populations get paid attention to. So, so I, I hear a, a shift in theory of change, and, and I should have said, welcome to Grantmakers for Education, <laughs> right? And so philanthropy could be a really important sector in, in thinking about this change. But what I hear you say is, if No Child Left Behind became about uh, sort of uh, fidelity to law theory, a compliance, there are four models to turn around schools, just do them, right? that the pivot here is not to lower the expectations or, or the actions that need to occur or the guardrails, hopefully, but to say it's about transparency, it's about engagement, 
we've got to build that energy in the field to move this. Is that right? And, and then what are, the, what are the opportunities and risks? You could see innovation, but you could see a lot of unevenness Correct. from that. And you will see unevenness. Uh, I mean, you all have done a fantastic job in analyzing uh, these state plans as they very quickly come across uh, the secretary's desk, but there is an unbelievably wide variant in the way in which they are implementing the accountability uh, provisions. Uh, and so the reality is um, you are going to have some uh, states in which low-income kids and minority kids and disabled kids have very few uh, statutory protections or protections in the way in which the law is implemented. And so um, what, what we still have, though, is data. We still do require these states to, um, again, according to their own metrics of performance, um, have an, an ability for parents to see what schools are hitting those benchmarks and what aren't. But if you don't have empowered communities of parents, uh, of students, of educational advocates, then that information is useless. Uh, so for many of us that, um, uh, that voted for this, uh, even though we were a little bit squeamish about the amount of authority we were transferring to states, we did so based upon the hope that there would be this massive effort to empower local educational advocates, and philanthropy has to be a part of that, in order to make use of this new uh, reliance on data and sunlight that replaces that heavier hand of federal intervention. And, and, and let's go one degree deeper on this. One of the other things I love that that, that Senator does uh, as he's, I don't know if you do it every year anyway, but as you're approaching a, a re-election is he walks across the Connecticut, right? You literally yeah. walk from one side of the state it's to the Texas, other. It's not Texas, it's just Connecticut. Still, so, you know. still that's, not a, that's not a stroll, I think. So, and, 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 you know, so what is your advice then either on what would be most important and effective to engage those communities locally? And then the obvious, maybe even more in your sweet spot reverse, is how do you then take that information, want that information to hopefully use that bully pulpit, use that policy to scale? Well, it's, so it's interesting. I've done this the last couple of years, and it's a wonderful sort of week-long focus group. You know, I walk about uh, 25 miles a day for five or six days and just talk to, you know, uh, hundreds of apolitical people. And it confirms the central premise of ESSA. I, I think today with all of these competing and various inputs coming into people's lives, information flowing in in a more chaotic way than ever before, um, it is harder for people to accept governance that is further away from them. They just feel safer if the people making decisions over the control of their lives it is closer to them. And, and that speaks to why people have less faith in, in Washington-based solutions than ever before. But it also, talk, it also speaks to why Brussels is having a hard time making its case to the Europeans uh, as to why there should be a, a central governance authority. Thanks for bringing in the foreign affairs. There, right? right? That so, was good, yeah. So, but, I, but, I, but, I do, but it does reaffirm for me that we probably aren't going back, right? that we are probably going to be in a world under a Republican or Democratic administration in which there is going to be much more authority uh, for educational decision making at the state and local level, which means what you're doing today um, is not just about surviving the next three years, it really is indicative of a much broader trend line in the way that people want their lives to be governed. I will say though, it also is a reminder that this stuff really matters to people. Nobody on that walk, not nobody, almost nobody on my walk across Connecticut this summer talked to me about Russia or Steve Bannon or Anthony Scaramucci. Um, everybody talked to me about evergreen issues, healthcare, education, how much money is coming into their house, how much money is going out of their house. That was 80% of the conversations. And so despite the fact that it doesn't appear that the country is having a conversation about education, um, for those of us that are walking the streets, they are every single day, and it's and, and that should be empowering to those of us that want to help those families figure out how to plug in to a decision-making process that is now much closer and more accessible to them. At the opening of the conference, to bring us full circle, there were some very impressive and passionate personal presentations related to uh, uh, community voice, and you could see the power potentially of the authenticity, the cultural competency, the sustainability that comes from that theory of change. But again, much more complex than it's a requirement, so do it, and think that's gonna be done with some fidelity, right? Probably much more accurate. But one gap I hear you saying is, or one need is, then how do we build that uh, 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 community voice and engagement, and I imagine that transparent understanding of the data and information. But the other you raised is, if the federal government still has a fundamental responsibility for civil rights, and you guys put in guardrails, 
and for whatever reason there's not going to be very strong enforcement of those guardrails, then how do we protect against the inequity? Uh, not maybe out of malicious intent, but lack of room, as you said, on the political agenda or the decision agenda. Uh, yeah. We can't go backwards in some of the most you know, uh, uh, disadvantaged and historically discriminatory places. Yeah, so uh, again, it just speaks to a strategy that has to be present both here uh, and uh, in the communities. You can't, um, you know, it's hard to empower local communities around these issues if the Department of Education isn't going to require that the interventions be evidence-based. Um, it's hard for that conversation to happen in 50 different uh, in 50 different states, and so um, you know, my plea is not only to help us build these communities at the local level, but we have got to uh, we, we've got to require this administration to actually implement the law that we gave them, and we don't believe they are, and, and that's an example of how that's not happening. We we told uh, the secretary that. Uh, if you're going to do interventions to turn around underperforming schools or subgroups, they've got to be evidence-based. When they sent the template out to the states, there was no mention of evidence in that template. That is a violation of the law in my mind, and so we need your help to both make that case at the federal level as well as build that capacity at the local level. Um, let me, while we still have a little bit of time, and let me ask, Hannah, where are we if we want to open it up? Are we getting close to that point in the... Ah, look at that. Okay, right at that point. I'm so good. So... Um, <laughs> But before we do that, let me, let, me, let me ask one other question. So you mentioned uh, earlier we were talking HEA, other things. So again, ESSA uh, is one piece, but now there are a lot of other important uh, 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 pieces of legislation in higher education, in early learning, in other areas, not to mention budget, uh, sitting behind this. Um, do you have a sense of what, if anything, is likely to get done? And are those things that have high risk, for example, uh, while the Senate has, I think, moderated, there's, there's some, obviously, presidential proposal of significant budget cuts. Uh, or is there anything that people agree on, HEA or others? Uh, uh, the research arm of the, of the department would be a great thing to, right. to invest more in. Uh, what do you think the landscape looks like in terms of, of education efforts in Congress? So, you know, as I referenced before, the most functional relationship in Congress today is between Lamar Alexander and, and Patty Murray. And so if you have any hope that something's going to get done, it is likely done there. Lamar obviously has a big interest in an HEA reauthorization bill before he is done as chairman of that committee. Remember, in the Senate, Republican chairmen only get that position for six years, so he is moving on fairly soon. He wants to get that done now. Well, he still has a partnership with Patty Murray. So we have all been hopeful that we're going to do HEA reauthorization next year. I've always thought that there is a deal to be uh, had there. There is a very legitimate critique um, regarding the overregulation of higher education um, that many Republicans lead but Democrats share. Um, there is a mainly Democratic critique that those who regulate higher education are focused on the wrong things, um, that they are not focused on outcomes, in part because we don't give them the data in order to focus on outcomes, but they also aren't terribly focused on affordability either. And so there seems to be a deal that you could, be, that you could do on HEA in the broader sense where we could pare down this, the size of the regulatory regime while focusing it more on the stuff that really matters to, uh, to parents. And so uh, I think what's happened in the last 24 hours hasn't helped. They spent all this time putting together this deal on health care, uh, on stabilization of the exchanges, and they just got the legs cut out from under them a few hours ago. If that remains the state of play on health care, it may chill their willingness to spend a lot of time on a higher education reauthorization that may or may not get the support of the White House. But I also know that Lamar really wants to do this, and I also know that if Patty and Lamar decided to do it, they would, because that's just how that relationship works. So, um, you know, we still have other things that, you know, IDA and Perkins are still hanging out there. HEA is the big prize, and I don't think it is beyond reach. Okay, very helpful. So I can see that some of you, maybe the most technologically enabled, have figured out the app and have put forth some questions. Let me encourage all of you and apologize in advance for my inability to do a tutorial to do it if you're so inclined, but I think I've got plenty also, so uh, if you don't, don't feel like you're missing out. Let me do some of these and then I might move us to a lightning round because there's so many really important issues we should talk about. Uh, so one of the most challenging ones that I get a couple questions about here is about uh, how we think about the role of education in the context of our democracy. 
So obviously we're in, I think, whatever your politics, and we should say this is truly meant to be, whatever your politics, that uh, the, the, the divides feel much more significant than they certainly have, whether that's just an awakening or a reality. And uh, perhaps we are not uh, paying the kind of attention to the role of democracy, to education as a public good, Dan and others, uh, that we need to. Do you have thoughts about that connection there and, and things that, that are important to know? Yeah, I, and I probably don't have very revolutionary thoughts uh, about it, but I but I have a few. Um, listen, we are we are we are splintering as a country, and we are splintering in ways that will be hard to get back together. Um, in large part because of the way that information flows, um, the way in which we receive information, um, uh, just solidifies our political beliefs. That will be hard to put back together, and so it means that the common American mythology. Um, that we used to spend a lot more time on, I think, um, in, in teaching in our educational system and teaching to our kids matters more now than ever before. I know, you know, talking about putting more emphasis on civic education almost sounds hackneyed by now, but I think it's more important today to make sure that we have some stories um, that unite us all, that the founding ideals of the country are stuff that every kid knows about as early as possible because pretty soon they'll start to get separated um, in a way that you didn't when you were getting all your news from Walter Cronkite. Thus, that storyline is more important. One of the most important mythologies about this country, which was never a mythology until now, is the ability of anybody to be able to be successful no matter from where they came. And we knew that was true because we did things that were exceptional. We made these big investments in public education, in getting kids to college that other countries simply didn't do. And so the mythology matched the reality. Now people have kind of looked around and said, well, wait a second, I know the mythology of the American dream, but I'm pretty sure that we actually aren't giving me the tools to realize it. And so if, if you want to make people believe again in that idea, which I think is central to the American experience, the idea of economic and social mobility, then you have to start talking in big revolutionary terms about what we're going to give them to climb that ladder. So I am a believer in the broad principle of free public education through 16th grade, in part because I think that that helps people. I think it's good. I think it's good policy, but I also think it breathes life back into that mythology that people need right now. And, and I will say also as a, a parent of, of two young kids in a, a local DC public school. Um, uh, the other issue is, uh, uh, from, the, from this list that I'll raise, is you mentioned higher ed. L let me take it to the early learning side as a place where uh, we have a lot of room uh, to, to actually live up to our aspirations and mythology. Is there any chance that we could put together a deal that actually tries to invest in the kind of infrastructure for birth to third grade early learning systems? It doesn't feel like it. Uh, I, mean, give, give, I mean, higher education, clearly you need to put more resources into it, but there are important structural non-monetary reforms uh, that, that need to be made. I, in, a, in an environment today where the Trump administration is showing up at the door with 40% reductions in discretionary spending um, and no real leadership in the Republican Party Congr uh, in Congress on the issue of early childhood education, it, it doesn't feel like there's space in the next year um, in order to get a big investment in early childhood uh, done. Um, maybe if there's a change in control of Congress in the second two years, uh, there look, might look further be. out. What do you do in that lack of space? Right? Is the answer of well, you you just go in, and I think there's some of this right. Work with leading states and communities. Work with others. Or is there uh, something to the developmental period, right? Do, you know, is there a belief that the, the pendulum swing, right? Do you, do you try to make it so that uh, uh, opportunity meets preparation? What do you do? Yeah, no, I, I, I think that's right. I mean, I don't, I, I don't think it's rocket science. I think you continue to make the case. I think you, you continue to make the case on, on the grounds of economic competitiveness. Uh, that you need to prepare these kids to start learning uh, early on. Um, and, you know, d just a few years ago, there did seem to be a little bit more potential agreement here. I think it'll ultimately take Democratic leadership, um, either at the White House level or at the House and the Senate level. But this is an area where I, Republicans won't put up as big a fight to follow. They won't lead, um, uh, but, the, but, but, I, but I think that there is, um, there is opportunity, given different leadership, uh, in order to get something done here. All right, we're almost at time, so I'm going to I'm going to move to what I'm going to call my lightning round and try to hit some of these questions at the same time. I'll I'll give you a word or two. We have not rehearsed this. This could go really well or not. <laughs> uh, 
and, and ask you to give us our sense of it, it could be, you know, is it going to happen? I, is it not going to happen? What's the problem? What's what's on your mind right, that you I'll want do this it, group I'll do to it, know? And I'll okay? do it. And I'll do it. And, in a, in and a I, these or are so. some really important ones. Okay. Uh, yeah. So so one is uh, DACA, Dreamers. Uh, so felt a lot better than it does now. Uh, the president seems to have put up these new barriers to getting a deal done, which may be tempting Democrats to uh, threaten shutting down the government unless the DACA deal is uh, is done. Uh, I felt really good about uh, getting the DACA deal done after the White House meeting. Feel. Uh, much less positive about it now. It feels as if the Stephen Miller crowd in the White House has convinced the president uh, that he should make Democrats own that issue. I don't think they're seeing the forest through the trees. Um, I think that the visual of these kids being rounded up and deported is cataclysmic to, 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 to Republicans and to the administration, but it now feels ha much harder than it was before the president put these new demands on. And, and I'll be the glass half full guy to say that that could change with a tweet tomorrow, right? So let's... Uh... Yeah, but the president seems to be the one person in the White House who's driving this. It seems that the president is the one who cares most about resolving DACA, and it seems that almost everybody else, are, whereas on other issues, the president is the break, um, uh, or the president is the one um, that's the problem and others are more constructive. On this, it seems that the president might want to do something but that he's got too many people around him, Jeff Sessions, Stephen Miller, Steve Bannon, and the crowd that he left behind um, that are winning the day. Uh, private school choice. You know, just limited things that DeVos can do on this. I think she's going to, she's going to work with it at whatever capabilities uh, she has to try to roll out some money to the states that want it, uh, but that's a relatively small uh, amount of money. Um, I, I think the sweet spot here, if she wanted it, is to work with Democrats on public school choice, um, to work on ways to make that more meaningful. Um, but she is not going to get Democratic buy-in to expand the amount of money that she currently has that she's using through the Innovation Fund. And so I think you'll see very limited movement on that issue. Okay. There's many more here we could get to, but I'm being told I'm out of time. It saved you from Trump as one of the, <laughs> the words. And um, but uh, before I turn to say thanks, let me, let me say two other things. One is, uh, I want to give you a chance. Um, obviously, we've got some great leaders in philanthropy here. We're also going to be hearing some really important leaders for states and advocates. Any benediction, any things you want to uh, uh, say or ask for that may not have been covered to date? I, and you can come back any time and continue the conversation. No, I, ju I, I just would double down on what I said at, at the outset. I mean, this is an exceptional moment in which we have transferred enormous decision-making power back to the states. And it scares me to death. Um, it scares me to death to know that these kids and these populations could be left behind. We are reliant on those populations and those parents and those kids being empowered. And if not you, um, if not philanthropy, I don't know who empowers them. Um, and, and so, and so my... I am always willing to hear about ways in which we can refine the authorities and the discretion that we've given, and maybe we'll have a chance to do that if this all goes wrong. Um, but for the time being, um, if the people in this room aren't spending time and resources uh, in order to figure out ways to empower these communities. And by the way, we, we have such new tools with which to do that. I mean, this is not an impossible task given the technology that can bind, that can, that can uh, put together um, these constituencies that want to make good uh, on the accountability provisions. And I'm not sure uh, where, uh, where it happens. So um, I, we've got a group of us that really care about this in the in the Senate, and we really look forward to working with all of you um, to try to put pressure on states to do the things that are required of them. So let me say thank you for your time and for your candor, and I know it would have been just as candid with our uh, to-be-filled Republican colleague. I do appreciate your bipartisan work as well. Let's, let's have that conversation again, too. But uh, let me say, and let me ask you to say, please, thank you to Senator Chris Murphy from thank Connecticut. You. Now, let me invite up uh, our next great speakers, uh, Scott and Lillian. And let me ask you not to do too much moving. Some of you may feel it's absolutely essential, but the rest of you, we're going to pretend like this is just one flowing conversation. Don't notice anything that's happening behind me. There's nothing to see here. Uh, but I hope that was useful in giving you a, a real honest flavor of the challenges and the realities. And I think 
um, also a little bit of a charge uh, and, a, and a sense of the responsibility. And I really appreciate um, our, our fantastic uh, second half, we'll call it, of the same panel uh, to help uh, illuminate uh, some of the things that were, were raised here. Um, how are you doing? Great. Good. I'm trying to read and work an iPad and talk at the same time. It's not as easy as I thought it might be. Uh, so first, let me introduce uh, more formally uh, Scott Pattison, who's the still relatively new, yeah. we'll call that, executive yeah. director and CEO of NGA. Uh, among other things, Scott, along with his great team, and if you haven't met Aliyah Solomon and others I highly uh, recommend it, have been leading a new strategy uh, with the governors about what they need to do and want to do in education that I hope we will uh, come back and talk about. Scott uh, also was previously director of the National Association of State Budget Officers, so has some background in not only state but state finance, and maybe we'll talk equity and other things. So thank you so much for, for being here. And uh, Lillian Lowry, who is the now, I mean, many hats, uh, Deputy Director for P to 12, PK to 12 mm -hmm. policy mm -hmm. at Education Trust, mm -hmm. trying to uh, keep John King and others on the straight and narrow. Um, Lillian is known to many of us, and if you look at her bio, she has been uh, a teacher, a principal, a superintendent, a chief in two states. I think an astronaut, a marine biologist, <laughs> I don't know how she does that, but uh, played a lot of important roles and been a really uh, important voice to us on uh, education issues, and I really appreciate you being here. Um, so what we'd like to do, again, is have a conversation, and then for those of you who I didn't do well enough in getting your questions on the first side, keep them coming, and we'll, we'll get them on the second. Uh, I want to turn to each of you both in terms of responses, but even more so than your own uh, perspectives and work. And Scott, if you don't mind, I'll, I'll start with you. Um, you heard at the end there Chris say that on the one hand, he thinks ESSA was the right deal, right? And I, I use ESSA as a, an entry point, but I don't mean to limit it to K-12, right? There's a, there's a much broader arc of education, but this, this deal of trying to figure out how is the, uh, there a clear national expectation and guardrails, but then uh, devolution and responsibility. And at the same time, I think he said, what it scares him to death, right? Because a lot of unevenness is their readiness, is their room. Um, you obviously, not only as an organization that's very important in this space, but personally spend time with governors. Give us mm -hmm. a sense of what you're hearing and seeing across both sides of the aisle. Uh, do you feel like there's readiness and understanding of not only the opportunity, but the responsibility, particularly in education? Uh, very much so. And, and thank you, Scott, for not asking me about North Korea. Ah, uh, yes. You're, well, we haven't gotten there yet. <laughs> But no, I'm, I'm happy to be here, and I'm happy to say several things about that. I, I, I like what the senator had to say, because I want to start with, I think the philanthropy community can be extremely valuable in basically providing the transparency and the pressure to ensure that the states do hold up their end of the bargain, because they want to, simply because if this doesn't work, it's hard for us to argue for that state flexibility. It's such a trade-off, as you know, when you do this type of a deal, because uh, there'll be variation. And so a lot of us will say, eh, I'm not sure I would have done it the way Minnesota did it. Um, but we have to kind of accept that as long as they're within certain good parameters as specified under equity and that sort of thing. And what has to also occur is there really has to be a partnership between the states and the federal government. That's critical. And what I can't reiterate enough, is we really want this to be successful. There will likely always be outliers, but for the overwhelming majority of states and governors, they want this to work. They want to demonstrate actual evidence-based improvement in the quality and equity of their educational outcomes. That, that's interesting, right? So when, when ESSA first passed, and particularly around school improvement, I think it was a chief, and, 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 and not a governor, but a chief said to us, I feel like the dog that caught the car, right? <laughs> yeah, I could say before, well, don't blame me for not having big impact. Right now, okay, then it's your responsibility. Oh, oh I've, got to, I've got to do something. And I, I hear you also raising the notion that if this doesn't work, then the pendulum swings back. Am I understanding correctly? Yes, and I think that's the incentive on governors and state officials to get this right. Again, though, there are always outliers, but for the most part, I think there's a real desire to make this work. You're right, I think they do feel that, whoa, I'm the dog that cut the car, and now I'm responsible, and we at the state level have much more authority and responsibility. But they really, really do want to make it work. And, and do you see this on both sides of the aisle? There was, a, there was a dinner conversation last night where people said there is a feeling that at the gubernatorial level, in the state level, there is still more ability 
to, to, to get things done. Now, again, to your point, they're outliers, but can you talk about that a little yeah, bit? Yeah, you know, I'm really pleasantly surprised by that. And I, 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 people say, what keeps you awake at night? And I do worry about, will the polarization within the context of at least the collective of the governors uh, get worse? It's not at the moment. I love to tell a story when in February we brought the governors up. They do every year, they go up and they meet with the speaker and the majority and minority leaders in the Senate and the House. And the governors insisted on staying together, Democrats and Republicans, even though the Republicans and the Democrats at the federal level separated and wouldn't be together in the meetings. So I think there's still that. And I've had some really great discussions. And across the, the, the board, whether it's a Phil Bryant or an Asa Hutchinson, Phil Bryant in Mississippi, uh, Hutchinson in Arkansas, Jay Inslee in Washington, Mark Dayton, I could go on and on, Mark Dayton in Minnesota. And they really, really care about education and they want to make it work. And I, I think a lot of you have seen this, but you'd be pleasantly surprised, regardless of what their party is or their ideology, when it comes to education, they really want quality. And another thing I want to mention that I'm really proud of, and I give Leo Samuel a lot of credit for this, who heads our education section, we're both relatively new. And for the first time ever, equity is a key factor in what we're pushing and talking about at the National Governors Association. And I, I, I want to come back to that and talk a little bit about then what does NGA do, but let me ask Lillian for, for you to come in. So it's interesting, Scott, that you started with the notion of uh, we need the pressure, right? You need the cover, the leverage. Um, obviously, again, one of the big bets here is around if it's not the top-down compliance, it'll be a combination of the state and local leadership and the community voice and advocacy. So can you talk a little bit about how you see that component as a critical component? And I may then come back to ask you to put your state hat on after Great, that. great. So I want to just begin by saying when I hear my bio, I understand that I am a personification of how great this country can be. Mm -hmm. Because I've had the opportunity, opportunity to do all these things. And if someone were to look at my demographics, single mother, segregated South, black, female, if we look at the characteristics that people usually use for excuses of why children may not succeed, I personify the ability in this country for that not to be the case. And so proximate relationships matter. I love that the states have an opportunity to take control of the agenda for their children and their communities. However, having served as a state chief in two um, different states, there does need to be an eye on the guardrails in ways that matter for children. I believe everyone has good intentions. I certainly did as a state chief. And to speak to the point about um, the previous federal agenda and what we did there around bringing in more rigorous standards and assessments, remember we all agreed on the what. States had flexibility on the how. So we, weren't, we did not have a plan given to us from the federal level, and we were not told, if you go and implement this plan, we will support you. Instead, the paradigm was, here are evidence-based practices that we know will make a difference in the lives of children, and states, if you are interested, and you, state, can come up with a plan with outcomes that will show a trajectory of improvement for all kids, we will support you. And so I want to be really clear about that. Somewhere along the line, planning is always great. We can agree on that. Everybody held hands saying kumbaya. But when it was time for implementation for us states to do what we said that we were going to do from the plans we created and had vetted by a lot of smart minds in the country, we started falling short. And I will tell you one reason um, that it happened in a couple of states where I worked is the convolution of so much at once. It wasn't that the plans weren't good, and it wasn't that it wasn't the right work. It was a matter of pacing. I will just say, though, if we had that kind of um, parameter around us and that kind of support around us, with agreements that we all made with eyes wide open and we didn't get it done, it really does make me nervous that now we're going to have 50 answers to the same question. 
I would, I would surmise that at least 50% of the people in this room are not living in the states where you attended public schools. So comparability was a hallmark of some of the work that we were trying to do. And once we have now pivoted back to 50 different answers for what um, readiness for college and career really means, uh, it makes me nervous not only about children from state to state, but even children within states where there is not benchmark or proficiency that really does look at success post high school. So, so, so let's stay on this because um, you, you stayed with the state and, and I want to make sure to come back to the what's the role of, of community voice engagement. Right. But before we do that, it, it's interesting, right? And it's, it's a little uh, uh, scary because uh, you, you're rightly challenging even maybe the, the original image of maybe it was like this before too and, and states didn't necessarily get it done. Again, not for malicious reasons, perhaps missions of, of capacity, of, of workload, et cetera. But, uh, how do, what makes this moment different from the prior moment then? Or, or what would it really take then for this to be different and for the states to be able to lead, assuming that we've got a critical mass that really has that intention? So I believe that I grew up with community advocates who expected us to be the best that we could be and they compelled us to, to do that. And we at the Education Trust are working with advocates within states um, and we're looking at a very eclectic group of advocates who will be the voices for their children, and that means providing them with technical assistance, helping to, them to understand the law, the flexibility in the law, helping them to understand the data around the children in their particular states and communities so that they can prioritize where they want to find consensus and push um, in the best interest of the children. Okay, so, you're, so one is community engagement, and mm -hmm. I want to stay on that for a little bit. But Scott, did you have other thoughts? Yeah, no, and, and I agree with that, and I, I think uh, it's, it's good to be nervous because I think that holds people's feet to the fire by getting the community groups involved and philanthropy and others, basically holding governor's feet to the fire in a way that they actually want because, again, they want to be successful, and I think there's a real opportunity here. I feel this is different because I know that governors were very active. They paid very great attention to the whole legislative process with Senators Alexander and Murray during the passage of ESSA. And I think they really, for the most part, they really do want this to work. They are also responding, as the Senator talked about, they, their constituents are really pushing for and, and wanna feel there's more of a community-based, state-based decision-making governance. Again, regardless of, of the past, that's a real pressure. We, I, I like to point out, we just commissioned a poll at the National Governors Association, and no one will be surprised by this. I mean, it's off the charts. Uh, very little trust of the federal government, but fairly high for states and even higher for localities. So there's, there's gonna be that pressure, I think, for constituents, uh, citizens and residents, that there be this, as the rhetoric says, uh, education closer to the people. But again, what has to happen is Everyone together has to make sure that we're focused on the quality. And over time, we're at the beginning of this. I think a lot of governors, if they were sitting here, would say, hey, give us a chance, and we'll show you. It's still early in this process. But, but after a few years, I think the, the accountability has to come forward. So, so let me push one more degree in, uh, of candor. So then um, you think in this moment, particularly if the federal is not going to do as much of the guardrails and others, national entry points like an NGA, in different ways like an Ed Trust become really important. Uh, what then can an NGA do and, and, and what do the governors need from that direction? And, and particularly in the tsunami of transition that's coming a year from now, right? Because this would be one conversation if the answer was all the governors and state leaders have a four year running room, but it is quite possible that, what would be the elections, what, two thirds of the states in yeah. uh, a month from today, a year from today, excuse yeah. me. Uh, so, so can you give us a sense of then, how does NGA think about building toward that and through that transition? How do we think about that? How does this room think about it? Well, and, and I'm glad you asked that, because I think that's critical. I think everyone in this room needs to be thinking about it. I will say as the Association of the Governors, and as you point out, Scott, we're looking at about half the governors knew the day after the election in 2018. I mean, that's significant. And so what we're doing as an association is really trying to make sure we're working with governors, education advisors, governors themselves. We're talking about this over and over again. Each of our main meetings where governors attend, we're gonna talk about education, we're gonna talk about ESSA and what they need to be doing. The other part of this, and one of the new values at what we call the new NGA is collaboration. 
and this is huge, and I know our education section under ALEA talks a lot about this, but we want to work with all kinds of other organizations to make sure that there is assistance, there's technical assistance to the states, and frankly, just simply making sure they do not forget. In other words, there's an awareness that S is passed, you have responsibilities and opportunities, and you can't pass them up. Got it. Lillian? So, uh, again, what, what, what makes you then confident and nervous about this devolution and the role of the community? So, first of all, I compliment you and your team for um, the evaluation and feedback on the plans that have been submitted. Um, there are three areas around equity on which Ed Trust is focused. One is the quality of the indicators. So um, we can talk about who sits in what seat and what they do, but if the plan is to be implemented with fidelity, let's look at what's in the plan. Um, the indicators need to be focused on children, and we need to make sure that there are important indicators, and so, most states have put in really student-focused indicators like um, chronic absenteeism and college and career readiness. We need to look at the school ratings and make sure we understand them. Many states do have AF one to five ratings, something that mom and dad can understand and just have a glance, at a glance, know how the school is performing rather than some that have dashboards that even some educators can't understand. And so how we communicate to our philanthropists and our families matter. And then the third, place is, and this is a hard part, what do we do around school improvement? And when we look at some of the plans, some, like Louisiana, John White is a rock star, are very intentional about what they're going to do, and others, is kind of murky. And so we certainly, I think the governors are being good partners with the commissioners. I certainly trust the state commissioners. And we want to give people time, but I want us to remember that those data points are children, and so how much time we give people to get it right matters. It, it is interesting to me on school improvement that uh, just as they're in the election cycle in these places, these schools will be identified and they will have their three to four year run time right when the governors will have their three to four year mm -hmm. run time, right? So it's an interesting political cycle about whether uh, state control really can make a demonstrable difference in our lowest performing schools. But let me do this, we focus a lot on SNK 12, let me invite people, if you haven't done it already, and some of you have, to send any final questions we have as we get close to wrapping up. And thank you all so much for your patience. I know uh, it's the post-lunch hour, so <laughs> stay with me. Feel free to, to sit up straight. Um, but let's bring in some other areas for a minute. Uh, yes, you're all, me too. Uh, so uh, let's talk about early learning for a minute. So you heard the very candid assessment from Senator Murphy. I know he's a big supporter, obviously, of the need to do more. Uh, for the first half of children's lives as opposed to waiting and thinking we can do it all in our uh, really third to 12th grade agenda in the second half. And there are clearly some states that are leading. You heard the challenge at the federal level. Uh, what, what, if anything, do you see as an opportunity or, or what, what is the focus for NGA at the national level? Yeah, that is something that I'm really intrigued with. I, I've been dealing with states in my career pretty much 30 years now. And I think that, at least for state officials, particularly governors, it's about the most I hear them talking ever about early childhood. And they're really talking about, I think, a lot of times the focus was on policy for, for toddlers and preschoolers. They're talking infancy, zero plus. And, and I think it's an exciting time. I know at NGA, we are greatly expanding the activities and projects that we're doing in early childhood, more so than we have in years, because governors themselves are interested in it. And I'm really intrigued with, you, you have a governor like Phil Bryant of Mississippi, or uh, you could go across the country of different parties and ideologies who are talking about this. And I think that's a good indicator of, of the level of interest and frankly, an increased awareness. And I think it's a fairly recent awareness of how critical at the state level, they've got to talk not just so much about K through 12 or maybe some preschool, but from the moment of infancy, birth plus. And I what do they need to do? And Lillian, do you have thoughts? I know you've... We met, and Aaliyah from NGA was met with us. Um, the first, one of the first things John did when he came on board um, as CEO was to put the P back into Ed Trust. We were K-12 and we went P-12. And so we've been meeting with experts across the ecosystem to determine where Ed Trust can be most additive, especially with a former United States Secretary sitting there that has convening power. 
because our belief is that the achievement gap walks into kindergarten. It doesn't develop there. If these children, zero to five, aren't nurtured, especially those who are most underserved, um, they come in behind the eight ball. I think Annie Casey says middle, upper middle income children enter with about a three, uh, 30 million 30 million, vocabulary, yeah. 30 million word vocabulary. Our children of poverty, 10 million. We've got, I'm so glad the governor, I know I worked for governors who were completely on board with early childhood education. And um, it started with mostly, most profoundly with Republican governors. Yeah. So this should be something that we can do in a bipartisan well, and, way. And tell John to start by adding the second little circle to that P and make it a B. And then we'll, okay. we'll okay. We'll do that. Uh, <laughs> uh, let me ask another issue. I'm, you guys are smarter than me. Here's the question from the, from the floor, right? Another area that I think might be an area for bipartisan support, and that's on the career readiness side. So one thing, Scott, I've heard you talk about is how for a lot of governors, the entry point in education is still around economic development and opportunity. Um, so we, there's still certainly a lot of room to run in thinking about what really high quality, rigorous uh, career technical education would look like, not to mention workforce training of this more broadly. Can you talk about that as something you're seeing as a priority or not, and how we should think about that as a, how the community philanthropy should think about that? Yes, you know, I think that is similar to what I feel that I've observed with regard to B through. <laughs> yes, thank you. Uh, Already it's spreading. Yeah. <laughs> um, but uh, yes, I think it's one of those issues where it, they may have spent time on it, they may have talked about it, but boy, it is front and center now. I mean, you have governors really talking almost daily about the skills gap. Should they be talking about apprenticeships? They're really trying to grapple with what do we need to do to deal with not only the skills gap, but, but the putting people in jobs that are well paying. Are we prepared for the future? One of the highest priorities of governors, as you probably know, is economic development and jobs. And what's interesting to me is they're starting to realize, I, Governor X or Y, I'm going overseas or I'm going to other states and I'm trying to get business to come. And they're starting to realize business is saying, well, wait a minute, do you have the people with the skills I need? And it's creating a huge incentive on them to, to really start to focus, wow, I better start looking at community college, I better start looking at, for example, Governor Hutchinson has been talking about getting coding in every single school, even in rural Arkansas. So you're really seeing, I, I think, a, a real focus on that. No, and when I saw a Republican governor do uh, free community college, right, you think, well, that's interesting to see from that, yeah, that side. Yeah. Yeah, Lillian, I don't know if you guys do a lot of work in this, but any thoughts on the career side? We, uh, absolutely, and we are um, looking um, to career. We say college and career, but we really are focused on career with the answer being a child leaves high school going to something. We, would, we want them to all be prepared to go to college, but we also want to hear their voices and hear their passions and make sure that we are preparing them to go into an a vocation that they will enjoy and um, from which they can um, have gainful employment, raise a family, and be contributing members of society. So we are all about that, and we are working with our advocates to think in a bifurcated way. And yes, we want to focus on four-year colleges and universities, but we also want to be realistic and give and deal with achievable goals for students. So again, we're, we're heading toward our finish, and you guys have been very patient. But let me ask you the opportunity for the same sort of uh, uh, affirmation, uh, 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 benediction uh, uh, request uh, from philanthropy. This way, it's my political capital and not yours, right? E e either of you. I do fear that um, we took what sounds like a uh, potentially more powerful theory of action. We threw out a simple one, right, that may have been flawed but had this, you know, false benefit of simplicity. And now we've put in place perhaps a more important one, but one that's really hard. And there's going to be a lot of unevenness and a lot of challenge. So I guess the question is, what do you need to be successful? What do you think is the role of philanthropy? If you have advice and guidance, I want to uh, encourage that. Okay. Either, who would like to start, Lillian? Okay, um, I will just reiterate the work that we're doing at edu the Education Trust. Um, we, now that this responsibility for educating all children has um, devolved to the states, we are working in states with coalitions of advocates to 
help them be voices for children. And so where philanthropy can help is to support those coalitions within those states um, to really have uh, resources, not just funding, but smart people around them who can help them think about research, evidence-based policy, um, and learning how to work with policymakers to get things done. We have been very fortunate at the Education Trust to have philanthropists who have supported us in this work. There has to be a guardrail around this work. There just does. And if it's not going to happen from the federal level, it is dependent upon the governors and the advocates in supporting the governors and the state commissioners to do this work. And we need support in making sure that the resources are there to get it done. Interesting. Scott? Yeah, no, I would agree with Lillian. And I'll also add just two major things. One is this, uh, the philanthropy community, I think you can be really helpful by getting those voices out. Governors want to hear what are their constituents thinking, what is most helpful to them. So that's really a value. But the other thing is, it's accessible, digestible information. I think one of the things, and I hear this from governors and their staffs all the time, they're never going to read a long report. So to the extent there's evidence and data and ideas and good policies that should be replicated and examples of what works, what doesn't work, strengths and weaknesses, again, in accessible, digestible ways of communicating, I think that would be huge and it would really make a difference. Uh, but thank you both. And before I ask you to thank, let me just say I think it's really chilling and important to take from the notion that, as Senator Murphy said, as I think you reiterated, the theory and deal came with the notion of guardrails. Right, it came, and, and in the absence of what might be as robust a federal role around those guardrails, the question of how is that maintained um, without stifling the hopefully great critical mass of places that are looking to win and even want the pressure. Um, I don't know whether that's certainly a role philanthropy is comfortable playing, but it does feel like there's a gray area that needs to be filled, and I would encourage you all to think about that, either from an advocacy or, or an implementation side. Um, with that, let me start by thanking all of you for your patience and your attention. I know it's not easy in a lunch meeting, and I hope you found this uh, useful and valuable and uh, helped me get through a good array of questions. And I know you will join me in thanking our two great speakers for their time and attention. And, and I, I lastly want to thank Aaliyah, who I may have uh, uh, gotten the wrong name, and I thought Scott came and just uh, usurped me and got it right, which was great leadership, so thank you for much for doing that. I'm just going to say Ali as many times until you guys come up and meet her, so that's my goal, so thank you for your patience there. And now I'm going to turn it over to Carolyn. Caroline. Caroline, see? There you go. Okay. So there's a third coming, I promise. I don't know who it is. <laughs> Anna. I'll call you Anna. There you go. Now we're, now we're all in this. Thank you, Anna. Thanks, Goat, for that beautiful introduction. I appreciate it. <laughs> Thank you for the great talking points. Too. Right, I really Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Caroline Altman Smith. I'm with the Kresge Foundation based in Detroit. It's an honor to be here with all of you today and with such a great panel. Thank you, Scott, for truly doing double duty with two terrific panels, uh, including Senator Chris Murphy. That was my first time getting to hear him in public, not on uh, C SPAN. And I think we can all agree that now more than ever, we are so in need of thoughtful and serious politicians who are willing to work across the aisle and also put the needs of students and families first. So thank you again for a great conversation. And I want to thank all of you uh, so much for the three days that you have spent with us here in DC. We hope that you have been inspired, that you've been informed, challenged, uh, and also hope that your feathers have been ruffled a bit at certain points during the conference, because honestly, if they haven't been, then we are not doing our job putting together a challenging and engaging uh, intellectual and professional experience for you. One of the main reasons I want to thank you is I know how much work it is to put together session proposals for GFE many months in advance, get all your speakers organized to run those sessions, and truly, uh, if all the folks in the room were not willing to do that, we wouldn't have a conference. So we are really dependent on our members' ideas and passions and elbow grease to put together a lot of the programming that we do. So I want to thank you um, for being willing to share your feedback and your ideas with us so that we can make sure that the members here at GFE are really driving the content that's going to reflect your needs and interests. 
We've heard many voices during the conference, and a number of the phrases and ideas, especially from yesterday morning, have been rattling around in my head since we had that great panel. Um, Richard Reeves mentioned yesterday, quote, higher education is the great equalizer in theory, but the great stratifier in practice. Those words as a higher ed funder are certainly haunting me a day later. Also, he said, inequality is in the end nobody's fault, but everybody's responsibility. And he also urged us to continue to be impatient about finding solutions and making progress on important issues, but to have the same stick to that we want to see in kids when it comes to being patient enough to double down on what we know is working and to be willing to make long-term philanthropic investments. We also had a panel uh, that debated whether improving educational outcomes is rocket science or not. And uh, the consensus, at least on Twitter, is that it is rocket science. So I'm glad we were able to settle that. And I also loved the suggestion that someone had on Twitter that perhaps for the 2018 GFE conference, we should actually invite rocket scientists <laughs> to be part of our community uh, and solicit their advice about some of these thorny questions. We also had a couple of really great questions from our rock star female panelists yesterday morning, um, including Alma Powell, who said, if young people aren't prepared for the future, then what is our future as a country? And Mary Ann Schmidt Carey, who said, how can we work in more coherent, integrated, and creative ways in cities and in communities to improve opportunity? And I know these are questions that we will all continue to wrestle with. And so grateful that GFE creates spaces for us to continue to have these conversations and to push each other and to push our own thinking to be good stewards of philanthropic resources, champions for children, and to help foster the change that we need to see. And lastly, one other quote from this conference that's really sticking with me last night at the PSA2 Impact Group reception. Uh, we heard from former Secretary John King, who works with Lillian, uh, who said, we literally have no future as a country if we don't do a better job of educating low income and students of color. Our economy and our democracy is at stake. That's an especially poignant message to hear in our nation's capital. Uh, I think you've heard those themes echoed through both of our panels um, over lunch. As Senator Murphy said, you know, our country is splintering. And that is a, that's a really painful thing to have to say out loud and to have to hear. But I appreciated his message of saying, education and empowered communities are our best bet collectively for renewing the ties that will bind us all. So that's quite a charge as we, in a few more hours, head back out into the world and to our day jobs to do the work that we do. So as Laverne did at the beginning with her lovely opening, I encourage you uh, to stick around for just a few more hours. We have one uh, additional round of breakout sessions. It will be a unique opportunity to hear from a range of cross-sector voices. And those topics uh, this afternoon are all gonna be focused on policy and advocacy. So even if you don't consider yourself necessarily a policy or advocacy funder, um, we do hear consistently throughout the network from our members that they wanna be engaging on this issue, they wanna stay up to date, and they wanna make sure, as do Senator Murphy's constituents on his walkabout, we wanna make sure that the voices of all of the different communities on the ground who are affected by policy at the state and federal levels uh, are getting their voices into the mix. And that's what this round of breakout sessions is designed to do. So hopefully this will serve as a powerful send off for three days of new perspectives and fresh communities, uh, voices and ideas. Uh, last reminder, I just wanna remind you since you've had your apps out already uh, to please fill out the surveys, which we do take very seriously in shaping next year's conference. And then just in closing, uh, I wanna say that Greg Baer, who is also on the GF, excuse me, on the GFE board with me, who's from Pittsburgh, uh, yesterday, he closed a session with a quote from Mr. Rogers, as you may remember, uh, to remind us to approach our life and our work with love. And so since I'm from Detroit, it's my prerogative to close with a quote from one of our hometown heroes with a message to the GFE staff, which is R-E-S-P-E-C-T. <laughs> Thank you so much for the incredible job you all have done uh, working truly all year to continue to raise the bar year after year for a fabulous conference, great registration numbers, amazing support from our sponsors, high quality programming, the timeliness of the topics, the great logistical support that we received from the Balcom Group. Um, you work on this all year, it shows, and so I hope all of you will please join me in thanking the hardest working team in the Education <laughs> Philanthropy Membership Association business.
thank you, Anna. Thank you to the board, our speakers, to all of you. I wish you very safe travels home after you go to the last round of breakout sessions. And thanks for your membership and your support of GFE.